Well, you can't win them all. How about that? <laughs> That's putting it kindly. And when it comes to AEW All Out, uh, this company certainly did not win them all. Uh, let's be completely honest here. This was not a good show. It just did not click. It did not work. The show was too long. Too many of these matches went way too long. You know, some of the things you were pointing to and looking for to happen did not happen. It, it, it just didn't work. It doesn't make you a bad fan of AEW to say, hey, you know what? Shit sucked. Compared to previous standards, like this was really bad. That That's okay. You are not going to win them all. And if anything, I would say, especially for a newer company, if everything is so great and you never make any mistakes, then you're just fooling yourself and you're preventing yourself from reaching your true potential. As is so often the case in this world, it's the successful people that embrace failure. It's the successful people that take their mistakes, aren't afraid of making mistakes, and by God, learn from those mistakes to actually get better, improve, and grow. If you are not making mistakes, you will never grow and never get better. And when you think about it, if you're not growing, you're dying. That is true in your personal life. That is certainly true in the business world. It's that simple. This was, this was not a great show. This was a really bad show. And there are certain elements of it where AEW is getting a lot of crap. And, and frankly, it's deserved. So you can sit here and disagree on it or try to put a positive spin on it. Like I'm putting the best positive spin you, I think you really could on it. Like don't try to minimize it and say, well, it wasn't great, but it was still a really good show. No, it was just a bad show. That's okay. You know, it's not like it's WWE with all these years of history where they sit there and put on a terrible show and then just try to spin it to tell you how great and awesome it was every single time. And they clearly don't learn from their history. They clearly don't learn from their mistakes. And I don't want to make this a comparison piece because at the end of the day, what you should be focusing on is doing the best that you can possibly do, not comparing yourself to others. Just not a successful formula. Uh, but again, not a great offering. Like you look at this tooth and nail match between Dr. Britt Baker and Big Swole. Have no problem with the concept of the match. Happy to see that it was added to the main card. Placement matters. This should not have been the opening match, period. For those of you that try to use the Meltzer spin of, well, now you take it off of the pre-show where you're seeing by more people. That, no, that's just bad logic. Let's put MJF versus Aunt Moxley for the world title on the pre-show then. What a stupid premise and what a typical Meltzer AEW cuck bias premise that is. What really hurt this match to me was not the match itself because it was kind of weird and it's kind of strange, but that can work. But you could have used this somewhere else within the show to kind of space things out. Having it kick it off, like you want to go into a pay-per-view getting people pumped up and getting kind of excited and get them really into the flow of this. Like this was not a good first impression. It just wasn't. It doesn't mean the premise of the match was bad. It was kind of weird, but that weird doesn't necessarily mean bad. Again, in wrestling, weird can be good because let's realize this is that even if you're clicking on this video to watch it just to crap on me, we are all weird. Wrestling is not normal. Wrestling fans are not normal. The wrestling business is not normal. And who the hell even determines what's really normal in this world anymore anyways? This show should have started off with the Young Bucks in the Jurassic Express, that tag team match. As to me personally, it was my favorite match of the night. It absolutely was. You know, it wasn't just the typical Bucks of Suck match that I've seen so many times over the years in New Japan and ROH. Like something I've seen them at times do in these big spots on pay-per-views. I actually try to work, actually try to tell some type of story, not just try to be getting a bunch of crap. And there are still certain elements of that, but I can deal with that more when they're actually trying to accomplish something here. My only gripe with this match that was really, really good in general is that this is a situation where I feel like the Jurassic Express, on the one hand, should be going over because you shouldn't be putting them in this spot to always have them lose big matches. And especially when you look at the freaking Luchasaurus. Like, this dude can be a star, a real tangible, legit crossover mainstream star. 
The Young Bucks can be stars within the wrestling bubble, and that's pretty much it. Like, we should be doing everything we can to make that guy look really good, everything that we can to make sure that he can really shine. And at some point in time, he's going to have to win some damn matches in order to do that. I understand from a storyline standpoint where this is potentially maybe kind of going. Nonetheless, really, really good match. Absolutely 100% should have kicked off the show. Because if it did, it may have helped a lot of the rest of the night. On the Casino Battle Royale, um, <laughs> you're going to remember it more. <laughs> Who's the Joker? It's Matt Seidel! What's he going to do to celebrate? I'm going to pull up Billy Kidman! <laughs> and then you got like, Ooh, what is it, Jordan Grace sitting there talking about, why are people laughing if he's not funny? Oh, shut the hell up! You entitled, over and overly sensitive puss. He was able to still work the match. Botches happen. He didn't get hurt that bad. It's clear. It's obvious. He's even talking about it on Twitter and making light of it. Fucking lighten up. Unbelievable. Like, that was a highlight. He got up there. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> That's the big reveal. He's the Joker. Well, jokes on him and jokes on us. What do you do after that? Like, how do you possibly recover from that? I assume everybody anticipated that Lance Archer was probably going to win this, and he did. You know, not opposed to that. But this match in general was just kind of there. Like, if it didn't have the side L botch, like, I really wouldn't have anything good to say about it. It just kind of existed. It was just kind of into being. And that was pretty much it. Which brings us to this bullshit that was the Broken Rules match between Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara. There's so much I've already tweeted about this, so much that other folks have already said. So let me just be clear on this. Number one. Just because you want to go out and do big things doesn't mean that you need to do stupid, reckless things when it's not really called for. Number two. Why in the hell would you book that spot or put that spot in so early in the damn match? Number three. Why put this needless, pointless, stupid-ass career stipulation on there that would even lend itself to the situation of, well, if Matt Hardy sits there and fucking has his head smash on the concrete like it's goddamn watermelon, we gotta sit there and have him overrule the doctors and go back and work so that way we can finish the match because, again, we gotta get our shit in because we put this stupid-ass stipulation in the freaking match when it wasn't needed. Like, as soon as it got up there, you just had a feeling something could go wrong. And then it did. And then everything... <laughs> and the whole momentum of the night went... <laughs> like, this was just bad. Just trash. And then the spin that Tony Khan's trying to put on it after the event. No, F you! What you're saying actually makes it worse. You're saying the doctors took a look and passed him. He passed the concussion test. Yet, apparently, he's in the hospital with the damn concussion. So what the hell does that say about your concussion test? But health and safety of your talent is your top priority. Oh, bullshit, Tony McMahon. Give me a fucking break. That was horrible. That was such a wet fart right there in the middle of the show. Like, it was really going to be really, really hard to come back from that afterwards. Like, you already had the side L botch which is the type of botch that you laugh about. You don't see anybody laughing about the Matt Hardy botch, and that's what it ultimately was. It's just two guys doing a freaking stupid, idiotic spot that wasn't needed at that point in the time in the match, and then having to sit there and finish it off because you can't sit there and say something like it's a no contest. You can't sit there and say, hey, we signed me one. I'll figure it out later. It's wrestling. You can figure it out later. The way you don't figure it out is by letting Matt Hardy go out there and continue and then having the judgment to let him because you got to get your shit in. Have him sit there and climb a scaffolding, what, 15, 20 feet so he can drop freaking Sammy Guevara down. Unbelievable. AEW deserves every bit of crap that they get from this because this is horrible. 
The match was stupid. The way this played out was unbelievably ridiculous. And the reactions afterwards by the company and the kind of deflection, this is the type of crap you would expect to see. I hate to use a comparison, but it's the type of crap that you see, expect to see from WWE. Be better! It's horrible. So it puts this AEW Women's Championship match between Thunder Rosa and Sheeta in a really, really tough, bad spot. And these ladies delivered the best they possibly could. I thought it was a really, really good match. You know, you got to find out plenty about both of these wrestlers. To me, just watching it, I'm sorry, honestly, you know, Thunder Rosa significantly outshined Sheeta here, which is very interesting dynamic. It's the risk you run. If you're not going to have these people on your roster full time, if Thunder Rosa is still NWA and NWA primarily, but you bring her in here for a spot, you know, now you run the risk of, well, why would I watch your woman when this woman is clearly has more star power and clearly has more of that it factor? And to me, that's the impression I came away with in this match. As far as those wondering, well, why would Thunder Rosa not win this match? I mean, you're going to take a wrestler from another company and have her beat your woman? Like, what does that look like? I mean, that's why I sometimes don't like these invasion types of stories. I don't like these, you know, dual promotion type of matches because you, know, you just put yourself at times into a very, very bad situation. Really, really good match, though. And they did the best. Coming off of that and that really, really tough spot, my hat's off to both of them because I thought they did really, really good work. I just thought Thunder Rosa shined a lot more. Uh, the eight-man tag was just weird. Like, I would have rather just had Dustin Rhodes do his promo than do this match. Like, it was weird. JR is talking about Matt Cardona is... Well, you know, he's missing something, but when he's figuring out, why do you have to say that? Why, what, what's the need to say that? The thing that he was missing in a lot of ways in WWE was an opportunity in a company that believed in him. And I'm not sitting there saying that that means that if he had gotten that opportunity, he would have been a main event guy. But by God, when the guy actually went out there and tried to get himself over and successfully did, the company did everything they could to cut his legs out from under him and put the screws to him. So how dare you say something's missing? It would be the first time JR said something stupid on that on this night. Which, by the way, by the way, you know, when he's talking about the wardrobe malfunction, yeah, it's dumb, but it doesn't deserve the level of outrage that it gets. People need to grow the hell up and calm the hell down. You know, and let's not pretend like it's men only that act like thirsty whores when it comes to what they see in professional wrestling. It's not just the men. You ought to see what you see from the women on Twitter and so forth. Like, you could say, well, that's JR from the past, and it's just bad. And maybe it is, but come on, man. His apology certainly wasn't a lot better. Like, he shouldn't have had to apologize for it. He didn't call her names or anything like that. You know, we are human beings. We are very sexual creatures by nation. nature. It may not have been the speech you wanted to get from me, but by God, it's the speech you're going to get. If something like that bothers you, then, then you need to ha have your head examined. By comparison to a lot of other things we've seen and heard out of professional wrestling over the years, have we got Matt Soft in that week to where that? Saying, did she have a wardrobe malfunction or was I just hoping for it? Like, really? Give me a damn break. Since you're talking about a bunch of half-naked men and women basically wrestling around in their underpants in a lot of cases and this is going to bother you, get a life, get real. But anyways, back to the eight-man tag. Yeah, it was lame. And then you had Dustin Rhodes' team win here. Like, it just did not work. It wasn't a Brody Lee showcase. If you said, hey, it was a Dustin Rhodes showcase, and I would have rather just had Brody Lee and Dustin Rhodes battle here for the TNT title on this pay-per-view. I know we're getting it on Dynamite, but shit. Like, I, I could have just done with Dustin's promo to give him another couple minutes because that work was outstanding. Certainly way better than the damn match. On the AEW Tag Team Championship match, I saw several people point this out online, and I'm going to completely agree with the sentiment because I appreciate the type of dynamic that FTR brings to a match. I do like the more traditional work, the more traditional style, the you know tag team effort, the true double teaming, the distracting the refs and getting the advantages. Like That type of component really works. But that type of component really works a lot better when you actually have a full arena, a full stadium of fans. And maybe this is because it was so damn hot down there at Daly's Plaza in Jacksonville and the fans just really weren't into it. But I was having trouble kind of getting into it as much as I tried because in part, I'm like, the dynamics of this just don't work the same without that huge audience there. But beyond all of that, it's just that this was an example of a match that went way too damn long. 
Like this whole show did not need to be four hours. Two and a half, three hours, make it crisp, make everything count, have purpose, have meeting, Sam, Bob's your uncle, get done and get the hell out of the way. It's when you intend to run four hours because you got to get all your shit in. And it's like the only thing people really cared about with this match, they'll say, well, I wanted a great match. And then, no, you were all talking about what was going to happen with Kenny Omega. Was he going to become the cleaner? And was he going to turn heel? And instead of getting that big dramatic moment, that big dramatic turn, you got what largely amounted to, in the context of this show, a popcorn fart. That's exactly what happened. And you could certainly make an argument from a storytelling standpoint. It was better to do a turn like this and a burn like this. And I might not fully disagree with you. But on a night that was already full of misses and blown opportunities, just really questionable bad decisions, like this just did not come across well. It just didn't. After a match that went way too damn long with way too damn many moves just to get to the whole point that was predictable for just about everybody watching. So no, I don't think it was a great tag team match, and I think it's a shame, but them's the breaks. Then you get to the Mimosa Mayhem match. And what was really weird to me about this is my interpretation of it was it was basically a no-DQ match, but you win via pinfall submission or throwing your opponent fully submersing them into the Mimosa pit. Like, I'm glad they clarified early on. I think somebody else pointed this out that with Wilson Mayhem, it's good that they clarified that if a leg or an arm goes in, that doesn't fully count because the way this night was going, it might just have happened, and it did, you know. But I think these guys did the best that they could. I certainly would not have had Jericho lose here. You know, don't become WWE Jericho where you lose to everybody that you face. That's not always the best thing for your opponent. It certainly is not the best thing for yourself and not the best thing for the brand. Uh, and even when you look at Orange Cassidy, look, I like the character, and I appreciate that he's different. But I mean, where do you go from here now that he's beaten Jericho? You could say, well, that establishes him. Yeah, but establishes him for what? Like, I would have rather had Jericho beat him via some schoolboy or a roll-up sunset flip type of bullshit. And then once the match is over and Jericho's won, then get the spot of Cassidy putting Jericho into the mimosa. So that way you get something for everybody out of it. I just... I did not agree with the decision. I thought the premise of this match was just kind of dumb, frankly. Um, it just didn't work. It, I felt like it was largely a, a wrestling match. And my thought was is that this was supposed to be anything goes, and it just didn't really feel like it was anything goes. And if my perception and understanding was wrong, so be it. it. Won't be the first time. Certainly won't be the last time. Again, an opportunity to learn, grow, and better. But, yeah, this match didn't work for me. And then we get to the AEW World Championship. And, and yeah, in large part, especially once Lance Archer won the Casino Battle Royal, you probably knew where this was going, that MGF somehow, someway was not going to leave the champion and potentially somehow, someway it was going to be Wardlow that cost him. And look, as I'm watching this match, I'm like, man, my appreciation for this match would be a whole lot greater if a lot of the night before it hadn't sucked or just been a complete miss. Or the fact that we're already three plus hours into a not great show and now i got to sit here for another 30 plus minutes of a match. Now, you know, time is money and the show just did not need that long. And this is an example of where if the show had been an hour shorter and this match did what it did, I'd probably feel entirely different about it. Like, you know, do I think that MJF is a main event character? Yes. Do I think that MJF is a main event level performer that can really deliver the goods? I think this match certainly did a lot to help establish him there. Um, you know, I'm sure fans are going to be excited about, well, what are Moxley and Archer going to do? This is going to be like Japan. and Maybe they'll fight in Japan for this, blah, 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 blah. It's just, on a night that was already lame, on a night that already had so many misses, I can't help but think that this was kind of a miss too, that... MJF should have left the champion. You could say maybe it was too soon to do that. Maybe it would have been. Uh, but then when you think about the larger overarching picture, what is the message that AEW is trying to send here? When you really think about it, that every single male championship that they have is held by a more notable WWE guy. The world championship is held by John Moxley. More fans know him as Dean Ambrose than they do John Moxley. That's an unequivocal fact. People look at Brody Lee, your TNT champion. 
More people know him as Luke Harper from the Wyatt family in WWE. The tag team champions, call them FTR now, but way more people saw them as the revival in WWE. So it's not just to say that these guys can't work anywhere else in order for you to make them a champion. It's just one of these things where now you're in a position where every single one of these guys is most notable and most known for being in WWE. It makes you look kind of second rate. And again, I know earlier I talked about staying away from the comparison piece. I'm just saying that you know, maybe this was a perfect opportunity to take care of one of your own, your more homegrown, if you will, or your non-WWE associated ones and have them be the champions. Like you already had Omega and Paige lose the tag straps to the former WWE guys. Now you have MJF, your top heel, losing to the former WWE guy. I just don't know if it's the best look that you want to present. And maybe it works, but I question it a little bit. I thought the match went really well. You know, how dare Dean Ambrose, though? Cheater! There's MJF. You know, the ring slipped out of Wardlow's hands and flew into the ring. MJF's trying to find the ring and return it back to say, there are no place for these shenanigans in this match. And Dean Ambrose, out of nowhere, hits him with the banned illegal paradigm shift. Screw John Moxley. Screw this match. Screw MJF not being a new AEW world champion. And screw this show. This was not good. While I certainly greatly and annoy, I'm sure, a fair number of you that watch this today, you know, that's why OTR Essential is not the wrestling show you want, but the wrestling show you need. Because you're going to get the unfiltered truth as the way I see it. And I'm not going to sit there and present with a bunch of bias. But the reality is, is this show is really bad. Stop pretending like it was something that it wasn't. That can be okay. And that could be exactly what they needed. Get them out of their comfort zone. Force them to rethink things. Learn from it, grow from it, improve, and by God, get better from it. Thank God this show didn't happen in front of a full audience. Probably would have been even worse, honestly. And you're still a young company. Less than a year in official existence, so to speak, as a television entity. It's okay to make some mistakes. Not okay that I got charged $50 for this crap last night. Want my refund. <laughs> But in all seriousness, like it's okay that AEW had a bad show. Let's not pretend like it's something that it wasn't, okay?